Madness Heart Press is proud to present the revised edition of Splatterpunk Award-nominated author Lucas Mangum's novel about cursed screenplays, vengeful ghosts, and Hollywood death cults. A must-have for fans of B-movies, the revised edition contains the never-before-published story, Hollywood Blood and Guts, and a brand new foreword by the author. Controversial filmmaker William Ward doesn't believe in curses, but he's happy to have the hype surrounding his newest movie, an adaptation of a notorious screenplay with a dark history. As production begins and people start dying, he learns the curse is all too real, and a vengeful ghost haunting the script is only a piece of the puzzle. At its heart lies a shadowy cult manipulating events behind the scenes. As dark forces gather around him, Ward and his girlfriend Rachel must find a way to break the curse before it's too late. The revised edition of Mania is now available wherever books are sold, and signed copies are available from Madness Heart Press. And there came a day, a day like no other, when the horror genre stood threatened by the forces of evil. On that day, the horror show with Brian Keene was born. Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Dave Thomas, Matt Wilderson, along with occasional co-hosts Phoebe and Dungeon Master 77.1, these ambassadors of horror stand at the door, bringing you the biggest names in the business, as well as tomorrow's superstars. Now, here they are, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. And welcome back once again to... The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Me Network, the Brian Keene Network, <laughs> available wherever you listen to podcasts such as Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms. I'm Brian Keene, remembering Mary to speak quieter, because Matt says I'm very loud in his you headphones. You are exuberant I'm gonna, I'm gonna and, and test, boisterous. Just said that Matt, how's this? Ooh, sexy. How's this, Matt? Is this quieter? I notice he's taking... <laughs> He's adjusting something on the headphones there. The room. <laughs> I guess I'll have to find that sexy music I used to use for the anime. <laughs> so yeah, Mary's here, Matt's here, Dave is here. Interior crocodile alligator. I drive a Chevrolet movie theater. This is what happens when you live with someone who watches TikTok 24-7. <laughs> What what the hell was that? Who it's, are you? It's it's, she, it's a song that people use on on TikTok. I guess it's some guy freestyle rapping. I don't know. I hear this all day long. He shouldn't he shouldn't quit his day job then. No, no, it was. No. But I like the, the crocodile alligator part. So that's how I remember. Is that it. like Hamilton hip hop? I couldn't tell you because I've never seen Hamilton. So I love the fact that Nick Mamatas has once again incensed the oh, internet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, by making fun of the the hip hop in Hamilton, yeah. With, you know. Disclaimer, I have not seen Hamilton. I have no desire to see Hamilton. In fact, I, I take a, a sort of mean spirited pride in the fact that I, I still have not seen Hamilton and have no familiarity with. I'm sure it's a lovely musical, just not a musical kind of guy. No, okay? I'm not either. I, I saw Miss Saigon, which was neat because they had a helicopter on stage. Right. Dungeon Master's mom, her boss paid for us to go see Les Mis. And that was neat for the experience, but I couldn't told you what the fucking story was about. A bunch of French people singing about how how much it sucks to be poor. I think, you, you know, wow. yeah. It, I think there was a little bit of war going on at the time, but you know, hey, know. just a footnote. It's just just a tiny, tiny. You know, for the record, there. I'm aware it sucks to be poor. I've been poor most of my life, so yeah, this is not a stunning revelation on the part of anybody involved with that project. I'm, I'm going to do a, a. Actually, I am doing a musical. I. I we should probably scrub this and start the whole show over because, <laughs> you know, Casey Lansdale and Chris Golden and I are, are in fact, still working on, on the drive-in, the musical, the, the Broadway adaptation well, I, I of Joe Lansdale's the, novel. The musical part. Oh, hell no. No, Casey. And it's, e it's easy. I write like a page of script, like literally one page of dialogue between characters. And then it's, okay, Casey, here's time for the next song. And then you have a, a blank page. <laughs> so – it's like it's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> the difficult part is figuring out what we can actually do on stage because you know there's a lot right, of big right. moving pieces in the driving. But, uh, 
But anyway, yeah, hi, welcome to the show. Um, we're going to try to keep things a lot more lighthearted than last week's episode. Uh, with that in mind, coming up in the second half of the show, F. Paul Wilson finally Woo-hoo! makes his return. Hey, he, We've been on the air six years. He was with us season one. And then his people got a hold of him and said, you're, Stop you're, Stop it. Yeah. Don't be going on Brian Keene's podcast. Uh, but he's a free agent now and he's back. He's, uh, he's going to talk to us about his new novel, Signals. Uh, but basically we do a, a whole career spanning interview. Dave, I know you haven't heard it yet, but I think, you know, F. Paul Wilson fan that you are, I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, he talks more about the Repairman Jack movie than I've ever heard him talk about elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was so that, neat, yeah, actually. so that's cool. Um, what's your favorite Wilson novel, Dave? If you have to pick one, gun to your head. The Keep. The Keep? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That's the first one I read. It's still my favorite. I love that book. And it's a shame it's never been made into a movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we see what you did there. <laughs> you Then you need to check out this interview because uh, there's some there's some news about that, too. I, I've seen rumors about maybe perhaps – Having someone remake it. Well, so. well, Paul talks about yeah. that a little. I would say The Keep, probably still my favorite novel. Yeah. Um, and I, I really have a soft spot for Soft and others. You see what I did yeah, there? I see. Uh, nice. his, his short story collection. Um, something of, he was talking about. Banter Bord- going on today. A lot of banter. Uh, Borderlands. He talks about in the interview. Borderlands is going to be doing like a, a mega volume collection of his short stuff. Uh, so that'll be something to oh, look cool. forward to. But yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there to listen to. Matt, you know, you're younger. Um, have you read a lot of F. Paul Wilson? Uh, unfortunately, I have not read any F. Paul Wilson. Okay. So you made the face when I said you were younger, but, but there was a reason I said that. A well, lot of I your, I- <laughs> for, for your generation, I think sometimes Paul's bibliography is daunting. You know, and they hear Adversary Cycle and Repairman Jack series, and they're not sure where to jump in. But we talk about that in the interview, too. Um, so it's a really, really good interview. And you know what? Let's stay with good. Let's start with good news. Yay! Okay. Uh, David Nell Wilson at Crossroads Press reports uh, they had one of their best months ever last month. Because people were home, avoiding <laughs> COVID, and had nothing to do but listen to audiobooks and read. Uh, he says on Facebook, quote, I spent my entire 4th of July paying authors. <laughs> I, I, I think we could stop the quote right, right. there because that's that's all. That's, any, yeah. Any, any writer listening to this show, that's all they want to hear. Uh, but he goes on to say, I suspect there are going to be a number of very happy authors, very happy in all caps, he says, this was, again, the best month Crossroad Press has ever managed. I feel very lucky, and I feel very pleased to spread that to so many people. Over 200 authors paid today, end quote. Wow. Um, I can vouch for that. I, I got my uh, my deposit this morning. I was very happy. <laughs> so I haven't checked, but he's, a, he's very good about that. So. He's very good about that. Highly recommend Crossroads Press. Yeah. Um, more good news. Now, how many times on the course of this show over the last six years have we talked about Del Toro's adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's oh, At the Mountains of Madness? I know where this is going. Many times. Many times. Yes. And great. every time, Del Toro gets screwed by someone at the studio, yeah. and the movie gets backburnered, and it doesn't get made. Well, Del Toro says, fuck that noise. <laughs> uh, during an interview with IndieWire – About his COVID-19 shuttered productions of Nightmare Alley and Pinocchio, Del Toro said he is still adamant that he is going to make At the Mountains of Madness. Yay! Um, He even has a prop ring, you know, like a class ring from Miskatonic University. Uh, And he says this, he he tells IndieWire, that this is why I wear this ring since the project got canceled. This is the fake ring about a fake university, the one that appears in the book, Miskatonic University, and I'm going to wear it until I make the movie. And he goes on to say, even if they have to bury him with it. (laughs) Wow. Okay. (laughs) Now, I went back through the show archives about how many times this thing got greenlit and we got excited. Uh, The first time we reported on it, James Cameron had signed on to co-produce with it. Uh couple other times we reported on it, it's when Tom Cruise was involved. Right. We found out 
first we were surprised that Tom Cruise was in fact an H.P. Lovecraft fan. Like he championed to be involved in this movie. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, then we did a follow up news story where, you know, he was going to star and it was greenlit and we all thought it was going to happen. Then we were reported again when it didn't happen. Um, you know, we reported when he made what was the giant robot movie, Pacific Rim, Pacific right. Rim, yeah. you know, to try to get the funding and it still didn't happen. Um, well, Del, Del Toro addresses that and he, he wants the, you know, his fans to understand, quote, these are not decisions you make. Most of us filmmakers, we exist in a world that moves above our pay grade. People think that our career is a series of decisions. Our career is a series of accidents happening with your decisions on top. You don't decide to do one movie instead of another. Uh, so, you know, he lays the blame where, where it belongs right, right. at the feet of the studio. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, props to him for championing that. I would love to see him do it funny to himself as much as possible so no studio can mess with it. Because yeah. one time it got canned because they wanted to make it PG-13. He's like, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not happening. And it not that is not a PG-13 story. So, um. But see, I wonder about that. I mean, if you're going to stay truly true to the source material, sure, there's some gore. Uh, spoiler warning, I'm going to talk about a novella that was published back in the 30s. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, it's about 100 years old. Yeah, so. you know, the, yeah. the expedition team gets slaughtered. Sure. The aliens themselves get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there's not there's not only a lot of not a lot of gore, there's not a lot of action. It's the main character walking through this, you know, this prehistoric right. civilization buried under an iceberg and saying, "Oh, wow, this is cool." <laughs> <laughs> well, I would imagine maybe there there'll be like flashbacky things to action, you know, like however you'd adapt it to a comic book, you'd have to work with, I guess, stuff in the background. Yeah, there is a chase scene though, if I remember. Yeah, when the the Shoggoth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd like to see a Shoggoth on screen. I, That'd be cool. At one point. I read a, a version of the script online, and I, I don't know which version this was. You know. But basically, um, as somebody pointed out at the time, you know, okay, it, it follows the story. But if, for a movie, there's basically no action until the last 20 minutes. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. They, they'd have to restructure it you know, like with flashbacks right. or something like that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I distinctly remember that, that conversation about, you know, it must be PG-13. And I'm like – it's Del Toro. Right. I, th this is what fascinates me. You got Tom Cruise involved. You got James Cameron. You have Del Toro. You're printing money, people. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's Not like, for anything. Let them make what they want to make. Yeah. And you know, it's based on a, a popular property. You know, Lovecraft has a lot of fans even today. I'm pretty sure you can make money with his movie, you know, but, you know, typical student at Witter, like, we can't make a lot of toys out of it. So, you know, and, and no one's ever made it before. That's the other thing I was enjoying. You know? But you you can make a line of toys out of it. Well, not You for, could make Shoggoth toys. Sure. The, the well, starfish-headed yeah, monsters and yeah. the Shoggoths. I mean, and you could have the members of the expedition crew and yeah. and the dog sled team. And You don't even have to go that far. You could do what they did with, like, the aliens toy line in the 90s where they just made different breeds of aliens. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. for shits and giggles. <laughs> it's Shoggoth Jr. You know? Yeah. You know, as a kid in the 90s, when you would play with those. Would you then, like, expect to see them in the next movie or comic book? I find book? it's funny or that you assume that my father bought me toys. <laughs> <laughs> but you must have seen the ads for the toys. Or Yes, I got to see the ads and I petted the pages softly. <laughs> I'd be like, someday. But someday. Would, but <laughs> would, you, mine. would you get excited, like, like, oh, I bet that's going to be in the next movie and well, then yeah, it would never it was, show up? It was just stupid. Like, in the 90s, we were full of stupid fucking toys for rated R movies that we weren't allowed to yeah, watch. Yeah. yeah. So that was the closest we were going to get. So yeah, everybody wanted that shit. The RoboCop toys, Rambo, mm -hmm. fucking uh, Terminator toys. And yeah. Like I, rem I remember in the 90s because, you know, my oldest son, a little bit younger than you, and I would buy him the Batman figures oh, that were popular at the time. And it was all... The same mold of Batman. Just different just, colors. Yeah, painted differently. And it was like, you know, rainbow power Batman, fire armor Batman. And he would come to me and he'd be like, Dad, when does he wear his fire armor? 
And I'd be like, he he's never wore fucking fire armor in the comics. <laughs> I don't know what this horse shit is. <laughs> what are they teaching kids nowadays? You kids, when I was your age, we had <laughs> Mego Batman. Remember Mego Batman? The 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 little cloth. Sorry. Yeah. Cloth. Nice nice tie yeah, in back to Lovecraft. Yeah. Yeah. I, was about to say. I still think those things are amazingly cool. I, figures. I had uh when I was little, I had Mego Spider Man, Mego Batman, and Mego Falcon and Mego Conan. Nice. I don't, I don't know what Conan you guys can, are talking Migo, about. Migo, come with Migo was one of the, the first. <laughs> I mean, they it wasn't the first. The first was G.I. Joe. But they were one of the first action figures for boys, okay? This was in the 70s when my father still did not understand that these were action figures, not, not dolls. dolls. right. Okay? And Although he, the way they marketed them didn't help with that argument either. And, because, and, <laughs> yeah, oh. and they, were, they were about, I don't know, maybe eight inches high, nine inches high. And they had cloth costumes that you could take on and off. Oh, and they didn't Not really, dolls. yeah, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't really come with accessories. But you know, I would have Spider Man wear Batman's costume, and and I'd put Falcon's costume on Conan. We and, did that with Barbie, sure. You know, and all I knew about Conan was the comics. I hadn't yet discovered the the books and the stories. So, you know, I I can't remember in Marvel he had his partner was. Uh, Oh, I can't. Ma- I want to say Machiste, but that was that was the Warlord's partner. Do you remember Dave? No, nah, I, I don't. Remember. Anyway, you know it's it's Conan and this black dude whose name I can't remember. Okay. okay, so I would take Falcon's costume off, and then I would pretend he was he was Conan's Conan's buddy. Okay, because you know I only had the four toys, so I had to expand them and make them. <laughs> oh, I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway. What are toys? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got off on a tangent there, but you know what? You know, it's yeah, fun. You know what? After that's last nice. week's pleasant, show, yes. I, I don't care. Well, talk about toys is maybe off. a nice yeah. thing. Yeah. Did you, did you guys get much feedback on last week's show? I, I did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a couple of private emails. I'm not going to say from who they're from, but uh, thanking us or thanking me for, you know, doing what we did. And um, I heard from... I mean, you guys are on Twitter, so there's a lot of people. Yeah, I it, I personally, if I didn't respond to you, uh, it's because I had to turn my mentions off because right. it, it was just it was impossible. Yeah, I, I impossible just, to get anything. I didn't done. respond to very many. I was just, you know told people thank you, and I, I I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, in regards to the second story from last week, the Alan Beach story, um, a couple more, yeah, a couple is two, uh, two more people reached out off the record. Uh, so I won't share their stories, uh, but you know they they seem to have had similar experiences over the years. Uh, so that's unfortunate. But you know what? We're not getting into all that today. Um, we're gonna, we're going to keep things lighthearted and talk about toys. Okay. So and Dungeon Master has uh, uh, something he wants to share with the audience as well. Mary, why don't you go have him come up now? For those listening at home. Uh, we have a because of the pandemic, we have a firm rule here in the studio: only four people in the studio at a time. Um, so why don't you send him up here, okay, to give his special announcement, and then you stay out until he leaves, and then you can come back in, okay, okay, all right. I right. will be back, folks. All right. all right, now we've sent Mary away as a ruse. We really wanted to talk about her while she's gone. Go on. <laughs> Yeah, that's going work. <laughs> so, and and Dave and Matt are masking up while we do that because we're we're taking no chances with Dungeon Master. Matt, do you play Animal Crossing? No, no, I don't either. But that's I, like the I, new thing. I wish I did. I uh, <laughs> I I spent. You know, we're we're talking about last week's show. Let me tell you guys what I did to unwind. I got off the internet and I played Minecraft with Dungeon Master and with Bracken McLeod's son. He logged on and played with us. And I, I don't ever want to work again. I just – I want somebody to pay me to play Minecraft all day long. <laughs> well, I'm sure that's feasible. Um, <laughs> have, you guys played, uh, have you guys played uh, Minecraft Dungeons at all? Uh, we've started to, but the problem is you, you can't play it simultaneously. You've got to be on different Xboxes. Oh, so we haven't used that as a result. But here, here comes, speaking of Dungeons – Dungeon Master 77.1 himself approaching the microphone. And we were talking about 
me, you, and, and Bracken Son playing Minecraft. And I was going to mention that you've also been playing a lot of Animal Crossing, and you have a plea to Australian listeners of the horror show. So if you're out there and you're, you can be on the South Pole or any place um, where you can um, get different kinds of creatures other than North America. I plead you to please send me dodo codes for um, your <laughs> island so I can go around there and catch it, different kinds of insects and fish. And then I can give you my dodo code, which I don't know yet, but I'll um, tell anyone who... Well, Dad will tell. Dad, Dad will share that information privately. We don't want that up online, okay? Okay. Okay. And then... For all of you Australian people, you can come here, you can come on my island and hunt for North American okay, so, insects. So basically, for parents out there listening whose kids play Animal Crossing, okay, so you're, you're here in America, you're in central Pennsylvania, and there's animals that players in Australia, or you mentioned the South Pole, anybody playing down in Antarctica, there's animals that only they can get in their geographic region, right? Yeah. So you want them to send you their code, and then you're going to exchange your code, and then people playing in Australia can come to central Pennsylvania and catch animals, and you can go to Australia and catch animals. Yeah. And you do all this via the, the Nintendo Switch. Yes. I see. I did not know you could travel the world on Nintendo Switch. I could have yeah. taken a lot more vacations. Yeah. All right. All right. So – if, if if listeners out there have what is it dodo code? Yes, yep. a dodo all right. Code. If if you're in Australia or the South Pole, or is there anywhere else anywhere else across the world? I don't think so. No, just those two. Those are the ones you're interested in. If you could email your dodo code to Brian Keen at live dot com. That's B R I A N K E K E E N E at live dot com. Okay, and of course. Look, we're dealing with our children here. I'm going to respect your privacy. You respect my privacy. But I will then give you Dungeon Master's Dodo code to share with your child, and everybody can can catch animals. Yeah. All right? All right. All right. And that's all you've got for the listeners? That's all I got. All right. Well, we appreciate you stopping by. Are, are you and Bracken's son down there playing Minecraft right now? We are. We're um, killing Endermen. You're killing Endermen. All right. Well, as you, as Bracken and I would. It's, it's nice to see the next generation doing that. So, <laughs> all right. Can you send Mary back up? Yep. All right. Thank you, buddy. Mm-hmm. Dungeon Master 77.1, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, do you play? You don't play Animal Crossing. I don't, but I do play Minecraft. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So I tried to play Animal Crossing years ago. Uh, it's like having a job. <laughs> like, seriously, you got to collect all this stuff, and you owe money oh, to some raccoon or something. And I'm like, this is work. I don't. This new one, Dave, is even worse than the old. Yeah, yeah I, there's so much more shit to do. I I, 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 I wanted to buy it because I found that there was a Godzilla statue you can buy for your house, and that was the whole reason I wanted to buy it, just yeah. because of that. But I understand it costs a shit ton of currency. Dungeon Master has the Godzilla statue. Yeah, he showed it to me yesterday. I'm very envious of how. Wait, how is he getting this money? Is that going to my in, credit card yeah, it's or in game money? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's in like game shells. Money. I think they're called. Yeah. yeah. Mary was laughing because you know I still play Fallout seventy six every night, and uh, she was laughing because I've gotten the reputation of being what? something of a fixer what? in the game. <laughs> what? Uh, I'm I'm the video game version of Repairman Jack. Like this this guy showed up the other night. And he says, he says, hey, I hear you've got good weapons. He's messaging back and forth. And I'm like, yeah, what do you need? And he's asking me if I got this and this. And she's like, how did he know to find you? And I, I guess word gets around. <laughs> then this, this little kid shows up. And, he, and he, I, I, he's probably a little younger than Dungeon Master. And he's mic'd up, too. Yeah. And he's like, hey, I hear you can help people. <laughs> And I'm like, what do you need? And he's like, there's these these high level characters, and they they keep picking on me, they keep trolling me. And I'm like, all right, little buddy. I'm like, first of all, are your parents there in the room with you? And he's like, yeah, I got his mom on mic, and I got her permission to to add her kid to my team. I'm like, all right, let's go mess these these bullies up. And so I got him to go to his camp, and I sat up there as a sniper. And as soon as they got wanted level, pop pop, sniped him. 
stole all their stuff, gave it to the kid, and then I had him block them so he, they couldn't mess with them anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, it's even, but it's even in his it's become a job. Like I yeah. log on to Fallout to escape the world. No, no, I I have to help people there too. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Well, we do have one other news story, and Mary, you're covering that news story. I am. So why don't we get to that, and then we will get to our interview with F. Paul Wilson. Okay. Um, this is about the international thriller writers and the safety of women crime authors at conventions. So it's a little bit like last week's, but it's not too bad. It actually has a fairly happy ending. Um, Wait, I'm going to stop you. And I swear I'm not going to talk over you. I'm not going to mansplain, but I have to ask ahead of time. Does this involve anybody we know? Uh, nobody I know. No. All right. No. Okay. Because I, I can't take another week of that. No, no. I All don't. right. Um, it, it's nobody that I know. So. All right. Okay. Um, it started with a, at least as far as the, the public was aware, I guess, it started with a tweet on June 17th from Lori Chandler. I believe Lori is uh, a member of the board for ITW. Uh, and so what her tweet was, and I'm just going to direct quote a lot of these things just, you know, for the sake of, uh, you know, accuracy. She said, quote, after thoughtful consideration, I have resigned as the ITW debut author chair. I and another female author brought serious concerns to the ITW board regarding a male author's behavior at an industry event. They were summarily and callously dismissed. I am saddened and disappointed to have to make this decision, but I feel I must stand up for what is right. For years, I've heard of women being harassed, groped, and cornered in, at industry events. And even with serious complaints involving a police report, it seems some leaders have preferred over the years to just sweep it all under the rug. The wonderful men and women in this industry deserve better. This kind of attitude does us all a disservice. And then she hashtagged it with stand up for women and time for change. Now, this was uh, covered in a little bit more detail in a subsequent article in the Washington Review of Books by E.A. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name Amar. Uh, in an article called The Demise, in which uh, E.A. Amar said, Lori explained her departure in three tweets, accusing the organization of not supporting her over an incident involving a male member of the organization and serious sexual harassment. ITW responded with a terse pair of tweets, which did not go over well with membership or the crime fiction community at large. And this is just a merry note here. I tried to find those tweets of the ITW. I couldn't find them. Um, and then... EA goes on to say a follow-up statement with, that attempted to clarify ITW's position only worse than the situation. I couldn't find that follow-up statement either. Memberships in the organization have been canceled. A thoughtful petition demanding answers and action put forth by the writer Vanessa Lilly has been circulating and has received hundreds of signatures. And a second petition calling for the resignation of the entire board made the rounds. High-profile writers took action. Blake Crouch, for example, uh, a nominee for the Best Novel of the Year in ITW's Thriller Awards, has withdrawn his book, Recursion, from consideration. Um, now, this petition that was mentioned in the article, which was put together by author Vanessa Lilly, was entitled Call for Resignation of International Thriller Writers Board. And essentially, the uh, petition... Uh, stated that the active members of the International Thriller Writers uh, were signing this petition that and requesting that the full ITW board step down and allow for elections of all the director positions, even those slated to be filled in October 2020. Uh, they requested that this be put to a full vote by active members, and if needed, they would submit a quorum of 10% of ITW member signatures. I think this is kind of how most organizations run if they want to do something like this. Yeah. So this is a mm -hmm. fairly standard uh, request. And then they issued a, a, for, again, for the sake of accuracy, they issued a basically chronological uh, series of, of statements about what had happened that led to this decision. So according, this is all according to the petition in case that's not clear. On April 15th of this year, Lori Chandler issued a complaint against a male member of ITW 
which included a police report and an additional witness, Penny Jones. This is the, uh, uh, about uh, behavior at a, at a convention. The ITW board summarily dismissed the request on April 28th with the points, number one, that the complaint did not take place at an ITW event, and number two, that she would not see the accused male member at an ITW event for another year. Oh, for fuck's sake. I like to say that not for anything, but yeah, because that's kind of how conventions work. They go from year to year. Yeah. So you're going to have this person uh, anticipate and dread coming to this event for another 365 days. Like, it, it's kind of, in my opinion, this is my opinion, that's kind of bullshit <laughs> right there. Um, following this, on June 3rd, the ITW board released a statement regarding the Black Lives Matter movement that read as contrary to the efforts to ensure safety and support for black members and communities at large. Again, I went looking for this. And again, it is my opinion uh, based on certain things I saw online. So these, I guess, would be allegations maybe that the ITW has since withdrawn many of these statements from the public view, which is why we can't find them. Okay. June 4th, the ITW board was unable to correct their statement because of a lack of knowledge about supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and sought outside help despite these being fundamental issues. June 17th, which is the, the tweet that I read to you, Chandler shared her resignation as the debut author's chairmanship uh, due to ITW demanding or dismissing her complaint. And the board responded with, number one, shirking responsibility for the safety of ITW members because the ITW member accused wasn't at an ITW event. And two, blame Chandler for lack of information, although she'd filed a formal complaint with the board that included a police report and an additional witness. <laughs> yeah. Burn it down. Yeah. It, Burn oh, it down. Yeah. But wait, there's more. June twenty second. Okay, the ITW board issued an additional statement with the name with the, with the name of the victim. Publicly? Publicly. Yeah. Not the name of the person being accused, but the name of the victim who did not want this information public. Who the fuck is on that board? Nicholas Pichon and Vox <laughs> Day? Despite purporting to give her privacy in the 61720 statement and shared this private information about the accused crime without the consent or permission of the victim. On the same day, ITW board issued a revised statement, still not addressing any of the concerns stated in the petition, uh, uh, which over 500 people had called, had called for answers for, nor did the board issue an apology for the earlier statement naming victim and crime without consent. So, in summary, basically, the petition says that they do not have faith in the board's leadership or direction. Uh, they ask for the resignations in a timely manner that would allow for the election of all board positions, including those already slated to join the board by the October vote, as stipulated in the bylaws. Uh, from I, It does get a little bit better, I, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, a little. <laughs> I mean, we're trying, trying to find, trying to find, you know, the shiny side of the cloud here. Uh, Six twenty-five update through the ITW newsletter, and this I I did get because I'm a member of the ITW, so I get their newsletter. On June twenty-second, the majority of the International Thriller Writers Board of Directors resigned their positions. As a result of these eight resignations, the 11 member board has lost a quorum to conduct ITW business under its bylaws. As a result, the membership will need to elect new directors in the coming weeks. And I, I read that as, um, and, and we get to this a little bit, uh, later that the three members that are there are there basically just to keep things running, but the other eight members resigned. And as a result, they can't do, the ITW can't do anything because there's no board members. Right. So they need new board members. So they need new right, board members. So, Dave, you know where I'm going with this, right? Of course I do. Matt? <laughs> but wait. <laughs> Prior to their resignations, the board took action to ensure continuity of operations until a new board is selected by the membership. That's the, the three members that are remaining. First, the board accepted the resignation of Elizabeth Berry as executive director, effective July 10th. Second, the board approved the appointment of Kimberly Howe. I know Kimberly, by the way. She's very nice. Uh, to serve as interim executive director. So I guess I lied. I do know one person involved. But 
in a good way. I would just like to remind folks that the opinions expressed by Mary San Giovanni do not necessarily reflect those of our show <laughs> or the or the Brian Radio yes. Network. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Um, I'm sure Kimberly's very nice too. I just I don't I want know. ITW's lawyers to sue us. Over the coming weeks, Ms. Howe will be managing the process of establishing a nominating committee to recruit and fill the vacant seats on the board of directors. She strongly encourages any and all members with suggestions for that process to contact her and then gave her email address, Kimberly Howe at thrillerwriters.org. Now below this, and this is pretty much the last uh, bit I have about this. There is a joint statement from the resigning board members. Okay. Uh, because most board members uh, that have resigned. Uh, here's, here's the quote. Quote, we are honored to have played a role in the success of ITW as a source of support and learning for authors, readers, and publishers. For many of us, it has been a labor of love from the first days this community came together 16 years ago. The last several weeks have been a painful time for our community. We have decided to leave the board with the hopes that it will foster some healing among our members and make way for new leadership that can build a stronger ITW community. This only works if the board has the trust of the membership, and we believe our stepping away from the board is the best way to achieve that, end quote. Um, and then finally, uh, Hillel Itali, and again, I apologize if I messed up the pronunciation of that, quotes, because only two members remain, co-presidents Heather Graham and John Lescroat, the board uh, lacks a quorum as required by its bylaws to name any successors beyond interim executive director Kimberly Howe, who replaces the departing Liz Perry. An 11th board member, author E.A. Amar, stepped down earlier this month. So at least the ITW board is is working toward... Well, what, so Heather's change. still on the board, right? Heather is on the board. Okay, because we like Heather. We like Heather. Yeah, I know Heather wasn't involved in that nonsense. I'll vouch for no, Heather. No, my, my impression, and again, uh, this is my opinion from reading the material, so I could be, I could be wrong, is that, um, that Heather and John Lescourt are remaining in order to keep things running so that the, the new elections can happen. All right. So you're on friendly terms with Kimberly. Yes. And we're both on friendly terms with Heather. Yes. So we get, Dave and Matt instilled as board members. Okay. And then we need one more person. How many people are on the board? Eleven. So we need six people to have a majority of the board, right? <laughs> I suppose. And then we control yet another writer's organization <laughs> from behind the scenes. Oh, wait. I mean A. A, a writer's <laughs> It sounds like they're taking proactive steps. It, um, go ahead. I I just I don't understand how you're the board of the ITW and you've seen this play out all year and last year and the year before. I don't understand how these these organizations still react in that that way. I I mean I. The only board uh, experience I have, I was a board member of the HWA for a brief period of time. I know that, and probably rightfully so, any organization has to take some time to consult with other board members and their legal team in order to make sure that whatever their response is, is, you know, legally justifiable and, and not leaving them open to lawsuits and whatnot. However, I, I think that it is probably in their best interest to at least say, hey, we're going to address this. We're looking into this, you know, to give something more than what they're giving people. And, and I'm not spe spe I'm speaking in general with organizations because the way the ITW responded, uh, again, not having seen those responses, but seeing the reaction to those responses, it sounds like it was almost done without any kind of consultation. I was just going to say, I was yeah. like, who was their PR person? At right. That point I mean, and, and I, and I, and at this point, the statement that they issued about stepping down sounds more to me like damage control. 
Then, well, yeah, this is clean in house. Yeah, yeah. this is like yeah. the, the comic saying, book you know, legal defense fund all over again. Yeah, yeah, we worked really hard for everything, and it was a labor of love. We weren't paid for this. You know, this was out of the kindness of our hearts. But if you all want us to step down, we will. And that's my opinion. That that that's how that reads. But if they're stepping down anyway, and and opening things up to new, you know, change and new leadership, then maybe that's. I mean, you know, that's how it kind of reads to me. I mean, honestly, after giving a person's name, the victim's name, and right. all that other personal stuff, it, it's like axiomatic to think that this wouldn't come around. Like it's ridiculous. Exactly. Exactly. I, uh, I like I said, I understand that I understand when an organization won't issue a statement right away, and it's yeah. perfectly understandable to me because I know from experience that you have to go through the right channels. You have to draft a statement that you know is both fair and legally viable and i know that that takes time so i i never really blame an organization for not responding immediately Mm -hmm. but i also think you know having been on the other side of that that if people are like really clamoring for answers that you can say hey you know what we're taking this very seriously we're looking into this um, you know, there's there's a process with this, but you know, give us some time and we'll issue a formal statement. Right. Yeah. You know. I mean, for fuck's sakes, if Wendy's PR can make Twitter light on fire for them, right? <laughs> right. There's no reason there could have been somebody behind the <laughs> exactly. fucking Exactly. Be like, hey, maybe maybe let's not release victims' right. names. The, right. The <laughs> ITW. Do you have to pay to be a member of that? In the beginning, you did not. If you were if you had published had a professionally published book right uh you could join cuz i joined in the beginning so is that i think you might have to pay now but you don't i so, mean i'm like well i i grand, was a, i was a member uh-huh and and this is no offense against anyone involved in the itw i just i was a member and for like the first month i poked around and mm-hmm. it was like right after they were founded right right you right. know um, and I poked around. I'm like, all right, they can't really do anything for me that I can't do for myself. Right. Um, which is always the problem I run into with any sort of official organization or union or, or agent or anything mm-hmm. like that. So I just kind of forgot about it. I forgot about being a member. The only time I remember is when you get the that newsletter. I'm a member is when I get the newsletter. Yeah. But then as you, you mentioned that you're still a member, I thought, well, I wonder if I'm actually still a member or if they're just sending me the newsletter if you're getting the newsletter i think you're still a member okay. i think there's a number of us who might have been grandfathered in i don't know if they charge membership fees now but i don't think they that are retroactively you know going back because i i don't pay to be a member of the itw but i know i'm in their list like their directory right um and also i think that here's the thing I, my thought process in joining is that I have to think how very carefully how to say this. Again, this is my opinion, does not represent the opinions of the <laughs> horror show with Brian Keene or any of its affiliates or Just say or that you're offering it as your opinion. I'm offering it as my opinion. I think for an organization, uh, most, uh, most writers' organizations help you when you're new. There, you reach a point in your career where unless they have the, the resources, to help you find a larger audience or to take on bigger projects, then membership in that organization is really more of a paying it forward situation. Right. Uh, one of the things, though, that I think thriller writers can do that horror writers don't seem to be able to do for a number of reasons that are probably not their fault is that they can put on, uh, I think, incredibly useful conventions they can they can maybe it's it's a case of having more money or a case of uh their top earners there isn't such a big gap between their top earners and maybe like what would have been like the mid list you know uh but they do bring big names into their um into their conventions and they do seem to be able to do more in terms of helping their writers network than maybe, you know, other organizations that one might be a member of can do. And so I, I think at, at that point I thought, well, maybe it's worth sticking around to see what could be offered in the future, you know? Right. So. 
Well, thank you, Mary, for that report. Surely. I got to tell you, it's a nice change of pace having someone else do the news. Yeah. That was my first news story, folks. I I see now why Howard Stern has Robin do the news. Exactly. (laughs) I didn't didn't have to spend a day researching this shit. Exactly. I didn't have to take a day off. Of course, Mary had to take a day off writing, but I didn't have to. (laughs) So, (laughs) all right. Let's pause for a word from this week's sponsor, and then let's get into that interview with F. Paul Wilson, and then we will catch you folks on the flip side. Madness Hawk Press is proud to present the revised edition of Splatterpunk Award-nominated author Lucas Mangum's novel about cursed screenplays, vengeful ghosts, and Hollywood death cults. A must-have for fans of B-movies, the revised edition contains the never-before-published story, Hollywood Blood and Guts, and a brand new foreword by the author. Controversial filmmaker William Ward doesn't believe in curses, but he's happy to have the hype surrounding his newest movie, an adaptation of a notorious screenplay with a dark history. As production begins and people start dying, he learns the curse is all too real, and a vengeful ghost haunting the script is only a piece of the puzzle. At its heart lies a shadowy cult, manipulating events behind the scenes. As dark forces gather around him, Ward and his girlfriend Rachel must find a way to break the curse before it's too late. The revised edition of Mania is now available wherever books are sold, and signed copies are available from Madness Heart Press. Okay, Mary. Today's guest previously appeared on this show during our very first season, six years ago. And since then, he has wisely stayed far away from (laughs) us. Uh, He's a Bram Stoker Lifetime Achievement Award winner, a two-time Prometheus Award winner, and a fellow World Horror Grandmaster. Uh, He's the creator of the immensely popular Repairman Jack and the author of, by my count, over 50 books, including The Keep, The Tomb, Black Wind, The Touch, The Fifth Harmonic, Midnight Mass, and his latest novel, Signals, which is a return to his popular adversary cycle mythos and made fanboys like me say, fuck yes. (laughs) Uh, I am, of course, talking about F. Paul Wilson. Welcome back. Thanks. Good to be back. (laughs) And I'm I'm pushing north of 70 books now. Wow. Nice. See, I I didn't want to brag for you. I figured you... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because... Whenever I do one of these things, people say, well, how many books is this now? And I, so I count them up. And um, I mean, counting the ones in the pipeline that'll be out you know, later this year. Right. About 70, 71. That's you know. awesome. I know uh, we're going to talk about an issue of startling mystery stories that you appeared in uh, that I have been trying to track down from online from various dealers that I know. and And they're like, you know. Every every time I buy something of yours or something of Lansdale's, the, these dealers know me. And they're like, don't you have everything by now? And I'm like, you can never have everything by those two <laughs> I don't even have everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah especially with foreign, foreign uh, editions. You know, I like to have it every state of every book. It's sort of a thing. Right. Right. And um, But I was just in... Um, <clears throat> My Biblio Mystery, uh, the Compendium of Srem, was just put in this Suntup edition with five other Biblio Mysteries, and the lettered state is $2,000. Wow. So I'm going to pass. On it. <laughs> you think they cut you a break? <laughs> you, don't, you, don't get a, you don't get a contributor copy for that? <laughs> I, I get a contributor copy of the numbered. Okay. But 250 of those. But the lettered... Um, you know, no, that wasn't part of the deal. So <laughs> maybe if there was a single author collection, they might do it. But there was, right. there was six of us in there, plus, um, you know, Otto Penzler, who uh, is in charge of, you know, Mysterious Bookshop. Right. Uh, uh, that would probably run into some money for them. So uh, uh, it's called Sun Tup Editions. And apparently they're very big with collectors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've got a, I've got a couple extra. I think I got one extra starting mystery stories I can send you. Well, Aww. well, that would be awesome, man. But that, right. 
I want. I want. That's why you don't have all of your stuff. I want the. I li- yeah, I want the listening <laughs> audience to understand that was not my goal in getting Paul back on the show. Uh huh. <laughs> sure. I still have a Howard the Duck Treasury Edition from the seventies. I had it when I was a kid, and uh, you gave me a copy of it at Nikon years ago. And I still, whenever whenever people are over and ogling my comic book collection, I'm like, yeah. See that Howard the Duck? And they're like, yeah, it's written by Steve Gerber. I'm like, that doesn't matter. It was given to me by F. Paul Wilson. <laughs> I was a Howard the Duck fan. Yeah. Yeah, but I've been just I've been getting rid of my comics. All I've got left is um a complete run of Cerebus. Yeah. And um that's 300 issues. And I would like to dump that. Um, because you know, it all comes in those phone books. Right, which um, are much handier and easier to, to to deal with. Well, you, I mean, you grew up reading comics. You were a, a fan of EC comics. I uh, bought them new off the stand. EC yeah. and Uncle Scrooge; those were my passions. Yes, yes. those. I didn't yeah. like Superman, Batman. I, they they didn't appeal to me, but. Um, Uncle Scrooge, I just love those. And the EC comics, especially the horror comics. Right. Uh, you know, EC, and I know as a as a kid and a teen, you were reading a lot of Lovecraft and Matheson and Bradbury and Heinlein and even, you know, more today, more obscure ones like E.E. E. Smith, Henry Kuttner. Um, So, I mean, it's easy to see where your desire to be a writer, particularly in these genres, came from. Um. I've always been curious. And I've never asked you this, you know, privately, but where did your desire to be, a, to, to get into medicine come from? Um, well, I was always interested in science. I was always a science head. Right. And um, so it just seemed natural to be a biology major. And um and my father was pushing me, you know, he said, you know, you, you love the science, you love all that stuff, you should be a doctor. You know, work for yourself, don't work for somebody else. Because he worked for a big corporation, he hated it. Right. He said, I, I'd love to see you working for yourself. And so, I, you know, I had all that behind me. Um, at the last moment, though, I really I really decided I'd, I'd much rather be a writer. Yeah. And... Um, so I, I, I decided I wanted to go. I wanted to be a madman. I wanted to go on Madison Avenue and write copy. And uh, I applied to three companies. They all wanted samples. I, I sent them samples of ads, you know. And um, all three took me. Wow! Nice. <laughs> and then I got my draft notice. Oh. And uh, it was either go to medical school or go to Vietnam. Right. So I chose medical school. Right. I'm glad I did. Um, I really, I think a day job, you know, something to get you away from the writing and out and in with people. Mm-hmm. I think that that was good for me because I'm, right. you know, I, I, I'm a, my, my folks used to have to just tear me away from the books when I was a kid. In summer, I'd just be sitting around reading um, all those people you just mentioned. Right. And um, get out and get some sun, get some health, you know, and get a healthy tan. And <laughs> being 89% Irish. Um, right. <laughs> I've been getting, so- I have to keep getting basal cells carved off me because right. of all the sun damage I had from, from that healthy tan. Right. Plus, I worked on the beach. You know, I got... Way back when, when I was a little kid, I got 50 cents an hour to help rake up, you know, the uh, the seaweed and stuff like that. Right. And the condoms and, you know, the, <laughs> the was out there on the beach. So, it was an education. Was that at the Jersey Shore? That was at Normandy Beach, New Jersey, right? Um, south of Manilogan, north of Lavalette. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so you 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 went to medical school. You graduated Georgetown in '68, right? Yes. Did you know your famous classmate from that year, Bill Clinton? Sure, we were on the same floor. 
in a dorm in sophomore year. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was high, high bill. I mean, that was basically my relationship with him. He went to the School of Foreign Service, which was on a different campus. And um, so, and he, but he started running for, uh, it was called the East Campus. He right. started running for office on the East Campus when he set foot on, on, on campus. You know, he, and uh, for all four years, he ran for offices. Um, so, I mean, and you also, knew, you know, vote for Clinton. You'd see those signs all over the place. Yeah. Um, so, but I, as to say, I, I know him, no. Um, we did have our 25th and our 29th, no, 25th and our 30th reunions at the White House. Which no, was, it, that was, wow. that was a kick. <laughs> That's cool. And the weather happened to be great. You know, it was in, we know, our first, what was supposed to be our senior celebration that Martin Luther King got. Um, he was assassinated that week. Right. And everything was called off. Actually, there was so much rioting that we were sent home. Right. Um, I didn't go. I had an apartment off campus, so I, I stayed, my roommate and I. But um, we were supposed to have the spinners and Chuck Berry. Um, and so for our 25th anniversary uh, reunion, we had... Chuck Berry and the Spinners at the White House. Nice. It, it was great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's, that's it, cool. That's it's nice to have that somebody somebody you graduated with with that kind of pull. They right. Can just, <laughs> they can just get the Spinners and Chuck Berry to show up. <laughs> so I know you know, like we said, you graduated Georgetown '68. Um, you started. If I remember correctly, you started submitting stories for publication soon after that. Actually, it was in my senior year at George, at Georgetown that I started submitting stories um, to Analog. Well, that and, was, and uh, I look back and I submitted like fantasy stories and horror stories, and you know that first rule: know your market, right? Um, <laughs> but and I would get the printed rejection slips. Um, and then and I was in medical school. I did a year of research at, at Ciba Pharmaceuticals. And then I, um, I went to medical school. And I wrote a lot during that year of research. Right. But then in um, my first year of medical school, I sold to... to to Campbell at um, Analog. He bought Ratman. That was my first sale. Yep. And my second sale was the cleaning machine. Yep. Which went into Sony Mystery Stores, but that came out before the Analog uh, right. issue. So, right. and, and I want to I want to stress to listeners when Paul says Campbell, he's talking about John W. Campbell, as in who goes there. Yeah, <laughs> as, as in a fucking legend in this household. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was. He could be terse, from what I understand. He liked he liked to argue, but or is what I've always been told. But he was pretty supportive of, of your early career, right? Well, he was the first one to actually write back and say why he was rejecting my story. Yeah, and no one had ever done that. And then this has got the Campbell signature on the bottom, which is right. a huge signature. And it was like, ah, oh, you know, and he said, "This isn't a story." This is a vignette. Mm -hmm. The story has a beginning, middle, and an end. Send me a story. And right. that, was, that was the whole thing. And um, I had no idea what a vignette was, but I, I looked it up. <laughs> and, um, I was a biology major, man. Come on. <laughs> um, and so that, then he became my, my absolute first market for everything. And yeah. finally, he bought one. Without uh, without comment, which disappointed me, but I realized that in those days it was Condé Nast, so he would just send a payment requisition through, and then the accounting department typed out the check. Right. So, 
it, he had no way of putting in, you know, but I, I would have liked a real pat on the back, you know, good job, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was $370, I think. A nickel a word. Yeah. Like 7,500 words, whatever it was. And um, I was just going through a retrospective and writing about that. And I looked up, I, I did one of those inflation calculators. Right. It's worth like $2,500 these days. Wow. Buying power of, of 370 back then was equivalent to 2,500 now, which is mind boggling. And you're wow. the you're the same age as my dad. So when I when I picture you selling that story, I can't help but think of my you know my parents you know with with baby me on the way. Or actually, no, I I, I would have been there for a year at that point. But you know, baby me there. I mean, three hundred seventy five. It's a lot of money, regardless of, of the situation. Yeah. But the uh, the fact that it came from from writing from something you've written that must yeah. have felt really good. Oh, it was like the best feeling. Yeah. The best feeling. Um, and it was just about that time that Bob Lowndes wrote from Starting Mystery Stories to say he, he was accepting the cleaning machine. Right. So I'm saying, hey, I'm on my way. You know, uh, I never got paid for the cleaning machine. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you didn't get paid twice, right? Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Because yeah, he it was uh, pirated shortly thereafter. Yeah, he uh, he sold, our, it, and sold it. Sold it to the Star stories, and yeah, it was like a galaxy mission or something like that. Yeah, 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 galaxy mission. Yeah. So, what kept you from just throwing your hands up in the air and quitting right then and there and saying, I, well, "I'm going to go be done"? About till much later. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to tell you when they steal your story. Yeah. <laughs> But I had I had a guy come up and say, "Will you, will you, will you sign my issue here?" And I said, "I'm not in that." He said, "Oh yeah, you are." I said, "No, I'm not." And he opened it up, and there was they called it the machine. They didn't. They took the cleaning off it. Wow, which was probably good editorial. Um, and I said, what? And you know, it's one of those things where you find out that. Those type of magazines had to have a certain amount of prose in them to get the mailing, right. you know, post office rules. Right. So that's why it happened. Do you and now you said you you have a, a copy of starting mystery stories. Do you have a copy of that galaxy mission? Did the fan yeah, give it to you? Yeah. Well, I said, you know, I like every state right. of my uh working if it's been pirated. No, <laughs> I have because uh, we're we're doing this on Skype, listeners. I I have almost at least one copy of of every edition, except for mm -hmm. some of the sci fi book club versions of my stuff. But I I don't have any pirated editions of my work. <laughs> well, that's, I, that's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? They may be out there. Oh, I'm sure they're out there. I'm just not going to draw attention to them. <laughs> you know, Eastern Europe was famous for that. And so was uh, Malaysia and the Philippines. And right. they were famous for pirating stuff. Oh, yeah. So. Well, I know what I found uh, with these official Russian translations of my books. I, you know, I, I wasn't certain that my stuff would sell in Russia because it's been pirated so profusely there. And what they explained to me is that the, the Russian translations of my stuff are really terrible. And people who have read them will pay money for a more faithful translation. And, and it, that, that seemed to hold true. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe there's something to that. Mary is getting up to go take care of her cat who's trying to crash your interview here, Paul. But so fast forward from, from those early sales to now, you know, there's an estimated 6 million F. Paul Wilson books in print. What would you go back and tell that, that young guy back then, that, you know, that med student who got that check for 375? I don't know. I mean, um, by that time, 
I had the bug. Yeah. I had written a lot of stories and they'd all been rejected. Um, and, but the thing is, I found I really liked writing. Yeah. And um, at first I thought I was going to be, you know, a dilettante. That was my uh, ambition. I would be a doctor and write a story here and there on the side. Right. Um, but I just found out I, I really couldn't do without it. The only time I stopped for any length of time was the year of my internship, where I was working 12 hours a day, 12 days straight, then two off, and then 12 hours a day, 12 days straight. Right. Just no way. You know, I was poop by the time I got home. Yeah. And because um, there were only two interns in the whole hospital, so they ran us ragged. Yeah. Uh, so, but that was the only my only extended uh, uh, stay from 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 writing is since I would say early seventies. Yeah. Are you uh, are you a write every day type of writer? Like, what what's your creative process like? Uh, I, I pretty much write every day in the sense that if I'm not uh, doing a first draft or or cleaning up something I usually have proofs to do or I'm outlining something else right. um, there's there's like today um, after I wrote crisscross back in I think 2002 it was so dark that story left me just feeling you know, like I, I needed a mental shower <laughs> and um, as a reader, I can tell you, I was like feeling the same way. I mean, it's great, but yeah, it's it's brutal. Yeah, and, and I and I pushed Jack into some dark places, and um, I had him. You know, the, what kicked off Chris Cross was I got this guy who's who's a murderer. Nobody can convict him of anything because he really hides it well. Right. So I'm going to kill somebody and pin it on him. That's what it, that was my premise going in. Right. And um, and you know when, when and the guy who Jack kills really needed killing. You know. Um, but I had him because he's really ticked. I had him gut shoot the guy. Right. And you know I said this is really stepping over a line, but I said I, I just leave it there. And um. I remember when I was out doing signings, um, some little old lady came up to me and says, you know, when he got shot, that guy, he should have left him for three days. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> My readers are more bloodthirsty than I am. <laughs> so, but anyway, after that, I needed sort of a palate cleanser. Right. So I wrote this... Um, Sort of a medical mystery, or almost a cozy, a young female family practitioner in a small Maryland town, and somebody she knows, she suspects was killed, and um, you no, know, and I, I wrote it. It came out like seventy five thousand words, and I never sold it. Um, but I, you know, now that in the shutdown, I looked on my hard drive and I said, wait a minute. I've got a book there. So I added a ghost and then wrote a sequel. I just finished the sequel, the the, the first draft. Yeah. And so now I have two books that um, I need to find a, a market for because it's one of those things that's not my kind of book. I right. can't, I don't feel right selling it as an F. Paul Wilson book because if they come in expecting Repairman Jack or they come in respecting the adversary cycle, they're going to be disappointed. Right. Um, so maybe I'll go to Mysterious Press. Maybe I'll go to Poison Pen um, and just see if they, they'd be interested in printing it under a different name. I wouldn't necessarily keep my connection secret. Right. But, right. Um, F. Paul Wilson writing as... Well, that's what they that's what they did in England with um my Colin Andrews books. Yeah. Um F. Paul Wilson writing as Colin Andrews. 
Um, this one I thought I would do as Nina Albert. Albert. So I, I still want to get on that top shelf. Right. You know? Because I'm tired of being on the bottom shelf. So if I can get... <laughs> I, I know get, the feeling. <laughs> I can get on the top shelf, you know, more people will see me. Um, but anyway, so, so many sales are online now, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, but so I'll be, I'll be, uh, I, I'm, you know, the nice thing about it, and you, you've written sequels and stuff, that it's really nice to have the first book unsold that you can change it whenever you want to do something in the second book. Yep. Yep. Because a lot of times when that first book's in print, you're stuck with what you oh, have. Yeah. yeah. I and, mean, right now I'm working on what I guess you could say is is my night world. Um, in that it incorporates stuff from the 20 books before it. And I'm so mad at myself because there's things I wish I could go back and change and I can't. Oh, and yeah. I now have to try to figure out how to fit them into continuity. And it's it's maddening. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And that's why it's so nice to have that sitting there. And, uh, and, and well, you know what? I, I actually should have mentioned this back here. Well, here, I'll go and mention it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, these two books will really be compatible. You know, there won't be any uh, uh, noticeable retcons uh, in, in there. But yeah. you, um, one thing I want to say, <laughs> are, are, are you um, putting all the rising stories together? Is that it? Everything. Uh, I mean, oh, okay. look, I grew up. Not only reading Marvel and DC, but your stuff, Steve King, Straub, everybody had their their own mythos, mm-hmm. their own shared universe. So from day one, the very first short story I wrote for publication, I I fully intended for everything to be taking place in the shared universe. So yeah, you know, I I post this on Patreon, and you know, it's a daily installment, and and. Fans will, you know, correct me. They'll they'll say, "Well, you said this today, but ten years ago in in Earthworm Gods too, you said something completely different." So which is it? So it, it's very frustrating. Well, but it's good to know so that you you can you can fix it. Um, one of my readers actually put up a website with every book from the Adversary Cycle, every Repairman Jack novel, all the characters, plot summaries. Yep. Um, oh, wow. it just it's it's a tremendous resource for me, um, because sometimes I will reuse a name and not realize that um, mm-hmm. a last name or something. Right. Um, but what I wanted to get to was that you know, BookBub sends me their their bargains every day, and inevitably there are books about. You know, zombie apocalypse. Right. And they all they all have the same plot as the rising. And, <laughs> I mean, how many times you know it must there it must be a world record for how many times people have done that. I mean, even Stephen King did it in Cell. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I think you know, this is a yeah, you know what? I think my my relationship with him is good enough at this point that I can gently tease here on the air. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, even so. <laughs> so it must be. It might, you should have a Guinness. You should be in Guinness for the type, the number of times that plot. And that yours was surprising. Was the first time I saw it. <laughs> but zombie apocalypse. Somebody's separated from his family or from someone um, or their pet dog or something. You got to cross through the gauntlet to, to reach. <laughs> God, it's amazing. Once again, Keen, it is your fault. It's all my fault. <laughs> no, it's not your fault that people are copying you. you know? <laughs> what were you going to say, Mary? I have, a, I have a question for you, Paul. Um, one of the things that Brian and I have chatted about a couple of times uh, over the last couple of years is that we're in a remarkable position to have seen the way publishing used to work, you know, say like 20, 30 years ago, uh, and how it works now. And one of the things that we always mention is that you've been incredibly 
versatile and incredibly adaptive to the changing in, you know, in the way publishing works. I mean, more so, I think, than many people who started when you did. What do you think it is like? I guess I get, I'm asking, how have you done it? How have you kept um, continually being successful over such a long period of time? It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, you could, I, I would concur. You do seem to roll with the punches. Every time yeah. some some major upheaval happens, you land on your feet. Um, I think it's, well, first of all, you know, I, I've watched the shrinking of, of, of the publishing industry. You know, mm-hmm. there were so many publishers when I started sending around. Um, and now, you know, they've consolidated and they've consolidated and they've consolidated. They're all owned by Germans and it's, um, or Brits. And it's, um, it, it's the, the big upheaval for me. Well, the thing is, I always wanted to write horror fiction. And in the 70s, you couldn't write. There really, there was no market. There was Blatty and um, Rosemary's Baby and an you know, occasional book like that until King came along. Right. Then he opened it up. Um, so as soon as I could, I did my three science fiction novels, or four if you count the Terry, and... Um, I hopped right into the keep. Right. And um, well, one one thing that, that, that has helped me, I think, is always being, I, I, I'm by nature a contrarian. <laughs> I, I, I always go against the grain, whether it's political or social or whatever. Right. Um, it's just the way I am. And um, everybody was writing small town horror in 1980. It was another Shining. It was another um, Salem's Lot, another carry. And I said, okay, I'm going to go big time. You know, I'm going to go wide angle and set it against the evil World War II, and it's going to really matter to the world and, all, and make it cosmic. Right. And, um, you know, I... Every company who my agent sent it to made a bid on it. And it was, um, we actually sold the movie rights before we sold the, the book rights. So it was a, and that's always done, that's always worked well for me. Um, when I wanted to write a, a sword and sorcery, I wrote um, Demon Song, in which I decided, well, I'm going to have a sword and sorcery, but I'm not going to have him draw his sword. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll see if I can do that. And, you know. Yeah. Gerald Page bought it for um, heroic fantasy. So I've, I've, I've always done that. I did it with Jack. And I said, he's not going to be ex-CIA. He's not going to be an ex-Green Beret. He's not going to be an ex-SEAL. He's not going to have any connections to official dump. Right. He's going to be on his own, and he's got to figure things out on his own. And so he became sort of a blue-collar hero that way. And... Everybody was doing Jason Bourne. So I went the other way. And so, I mean, in a way, that has helped me. Um, and, you know, I, and I, I was able to adapt to the new indie publishing thing that, that came in the aughts. Right. Um, because I never sold digital rights before 2000, the year 2000. When 2000 came around, digital rights suddenly became a a deal breaker. Right. But Mm -hmm. before that, it meant, you know, well, we got to put it on CD-ROM. You know, there was no market for that. So nobody cared when my agent crossed it out. Um, But the, the upshot of that was I had digital rights to my first uh, 25 years of writing and um, I made a deal with Amazon because my early books were not digital right or in PDF and that type of thing and um, or just typescripts 
I said, if you guys digitize this, you know, I'll put it up with you guys and uh, the, the, the five Laneg novels. And um, they said, sure, but we want an exclusive, you know, for at least a year exclusive. Right. I said, you got it. You do that work for me and you got it. Um, and so in 2010, I suddenly became self-published. Yeah. And mm. you start getting that monthly check, you know, from from Amazon. And all of a sudden it's like, hmm, I have other <laughs> books, that, I have other books uh, that uh, I still own the digital rights to. Let me put them up. And so I never wanted to be a publisher. But um, I sort of became one in, in that sense, just just self-publishing right. my backlist. Right. And uh, so I adapted that way, too. I mean, um, you know, it, it, you just got to keep your ear to the ground. And, um, and I, hung, I hang out with a lot of, you know, different people in different genres. You know, I go to mystery conventions. I go to science fiction conventions. I go to horror conventions. Um, You're the toast of the romance writers conventions. I'm sorry? You're the toast of the romance writers. Every romance writer I meet, the first thing they'll ask me is, do you know F. Paul Wilson? He, <laughs> he comes to our conventions. He's a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was, I have to, you know, thank Heather Graham and uh, Alex Sokoloff. <laughs> because I think it was back in 2005. They said, you got to go to RT. And I said, what is RT? Oh, that's Romantic Times. They have a convention every year. And I said, oh, they, they won't want to see me. And they said, oh, they'll love you. <laughs> and, and they'll love Jack. And there are no guys there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I went to the one in Pittsburgh. I think it was 2006, was something like that. And But before I went, I, I called my publicist up a tour. You know, I said, you know, Alexis, um, I'm going to uh, Romantic Times. She says, you're what? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Romantic Times, and is there any way we can send one of the Jack books, you know, maybe a few hundred copies uh, ahead and just give them away? Right. And she said, oh, I think so. I'll check, I'll check the warehouse, see what we got the most of. So they sent 480 copies of Hosts, which was <laughs> for, for, for romance re readers. And, um, I went, you know, went, Heather has it, gives a dinner. I put them all out on, on a table. And by the end of the dinner, they were all gone. Um, and I said, well, that's great. You know, I don't know what's going to happen, but it can't hurt. Anyway, I had a great time. Barry Eisler and I were the only male writers there. <laughs> and we were like the toast of the place. <laughs> they just, they couldn't spotlight us enough um at the end of it i took barry aside and i said we don't tell anyone about this <laughs> <laughs> and then but barry opened his big mouth and then well i as i said i've i've heard from romance writers that's the first thing they ask me is do i do i know you so so you left an impression on them, a good impression well, you know I, I went every year um they even gave me they gave me two awards. They gave me a Pioneer Award for Urban Fantasy, and they gave me a, a Career Award at the last RT. They, they don't do it anymore. Right. Um, and so, but here, here's the thing that, that, that got me. My website was getting 1.8 million hits um, a month. That was a hit. So those aren't unique users. I wish they had been unique users, but they were hits. Um, the month after RT, it, it went to 2.8 million. Holy wow. cow. By the end of the year, it was 3.8 million. And my webmistress, uh, Lisa, she says, what is going on? You know, <laughs> these numbers are insane. I said, I know. And it has, can only be romantic times. And then Dave Hartwell says to me, you know, we got a lot of action on your, your backlist lately. You know, what's going on? <laughs> I said, it's the BRT. So I decided then I'm going every year. Um, but that's so now a lot of male writers go. 
you know. But it also speaks to the appeal of Repairman Jack. I mean, oh, it does. Yes, well, I I often in interviews and stuff when when people talk to me about my influences, if if the Jack series comes up, I refer to him as an occult detective, just because that's how I think of him. Mm. But he's not really that, and and those books. They're not really a genre. It, it, it's a they repairman Jack genre, genre yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of cross appeal there. Well, it, I noticed that that's one of the reasons I decided to go to RT was that when I was doing signings around that time, I was noticing, you know, I always, I wrote repairman Jack figuring it's going to be 80, 90% male, maybe 10% female in the audience. All my signs were 50 50. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And all ages in, on the women's side, there were teenagers there. And then there's that old lady who said that about <laughs> uh, Chris Ross. Um, but that was the gamut. And I said, geez, maybe RT is a place to try. And right. you know, it turned out right. But yeah, I mean, and, and a lot of women at, at, at the romance conventions, you know, just said, you know, he said, we're, we're yeah. So we're all looking for a hero, and we're all looking for someone who has our back, and um, that's Jack. That's a great and, uh, way of looking at yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Well, you know, now you mentioned being a contrarian politically and socially, and and this ties into a question that I have about Jack. But there's a there's two pre questions to that question. So <laughs> let's let's start with politics. You've publicly identified for for much of your adult life as a libertarian um you know your early stories for analog there's an argument could be made there that they they've got libertarian subtext um you know in 75 you did a guest editorial for them that you know firmly let the public know where you stood um you know lipid uh you wrote that in response to ken ted kennedy's pitch for a national health insurance bill at the time um if you did that today with the advent of social media, it would I feel like it would be like walking a tightrope across a minefield. But I, I've always been curious, you know, 75, you write that editorial. Did you get blowback then or was it a much different reaction than it would be today? Oh, I think uh, I, I got no blowback from that. Nothing. Um, ben Bova maybe was the editor at that time. John Campbell had died. And um, he said, well, this is so strong, I need to get an opposing viewpoint. So we had Alan Norse drive uh, doing a Contra editorial. Um, Other than that, um, again, though, you didn't have that kind of um, interplay between writer and reader that we do now right i mean if they wanted to write to me they had to either write to my publisher or write to um my agent right uh, it was I, I forget which book it was one of the early jack books um i put a, an address in the back i had a post office box so they wanted to hear from readers i, I like interacting with them and i started getting letters a lot of them from prisoners um, <laughs> who wanted free books. Um, but other than that, you started hearing from them, but um, hardly anybody would write to, is going to take the trouble to write just to say they didn't like the book. Right. Mm-hmm. They may type out an email or, or a tweet, but you're not going to sit down and write a letter by hand or by typewriter, stick in an envelope, address the envelope, put a stamp on it and send it off. Right. Unless, you know, you've been touched somehow. Um, so those were those were great to get. Um an event and then when I brought Jack back in ninety eight, I started the website, repairmanjack.com. And then all of a sudden I started hearing. Um but you know, the people that came and joined and signed up were all fans. Right. So it was, it was mostly positive feedback. And some of them were critical to a certain extent, which is good. I like that. Yeah. Um, I learned from that. But nowadays, I think, you know, coming out like that, um, 
It would probably be, you know, the outraged monkeys would be um, howling. And right. um, that wouldn't affect me much because I don't pay attention to it. Um, I follow, you know, a certain number of people on Twitter. But um, if you get too political, I, um, you know, I, I put you, I put, I put you on a side group where I don't have to see you. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, no matter what your politics are. I mean, right. these these spaces, sure, we're there to interact with our audience and our readers, but we also need to make them, you know. Comfortable. <laughs> I, I hate to say the term safe space, but that's what it is. Yeah. We we need to make it comfortable for ourselves as well, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Chris Golden is, as both of you know, one of my dearest, yeah. dearest friends. Probably since Jesus Gonzalez's death, Chris is probably now my best friend. <laughs> um, and I've told him whenever when he goes off on some of these political tangents, I mute him for the day because I just can't <laughs> take it. <laughs> I need a break, Chris. Yeah, he um Chris is in a sidecar. Uh, <laughs> the thing is you don't have I don't have to agree with you. Right. But when it's you know, you're inundated on TV all the time with politics. And then I go on Twitter, I don't want to see more of it. You know. Right. So I I have mostly apolitical things. I, you know, push your book all you want. I'd love to see it, you know, but, you know, these rants um, and, you know, it, it's just strange how people that people surprise you with the the amount of hate they can spew. Um, I mean, Donald Trump is, is an awful human being, but I don't hate him. Right. I don't wish, you know, that he and his family all die. Right. Um, you know, it's just I, I'm just not a hater. Right. So when I when I, when you start spewing hate, and I, I don't, you know, back in the Obama days, I I turned off people who were spewing hate about Obama. Right. Um, I just don't need hate in my life, you know. Yeah. And exactly. So. So you go into the sidecar <laughs> <laughs> with Chris. <laughs> well, there's a there's a theory now. I want to state for the record to to listeners, it's not a theory that I agree with. But you know, I know a lot of fellow Repairman Jack fans like myself, and there's a theory among some of them that the reason. We've never gotten a Repairman Jack movie or television series is because the character is built on libertarian ideals. What what do you say to that? Do you think there's any credence to that or do do you think it's it it's not that sinister? No, it's it's not that cynical. It's um uh, I think it's incompetence and um indecision on on the uh, studio's part. Oh, so it's the um, same reason we don't have a rising movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, the head of the studio has never understood Jack. Yeah. Never. And the two producers who brought him in to Beacon um, just kept pounding away, you know, this, you know, it, it was they they they're two great guys, really solidly behind Jack, but um, unfortunately, um, Beacon did trigger the buy uh, button on the option, um, right. and so now they own it. Um, they own the character, they own the tomb, and they own the character rights. Um, I can't, but I can't fault them for being cheap. Right. They have poured millions into development. I mean, the number of scripts they have, um, it just, it's just amazing. Um, and it's, it's like a who's who of screenwriters. And so I can't fault them on that. But I, I think mainly because the, 
the studio head doesn't understand Jack, and he ske- he skews the screenplay certain ways that go with his misunderstanding of the character. Right, and I think that 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 has hurt it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Craig Spector did a, a great screenplay. Universal, you know, was saying, "Oh yeah, we we're, we're interested. We'd like to have one of our guys rewrite it." Well, one, one of those guys, a guy named Scott Nimmerfro, rewrote it so much that he changed everything that that Craig had done and turned it into a different story. Right. Now I don't know whether that was Army's doing or it was just Nimmerfro wanting to make sure he got his name. Because when you rewrite an adaptation, you have to, you know, 50% of it has to be yours. Right. Or you get screen credit. So I don't know what was behind it. But whatever it was, you know, nobody was happy with it. And it, and it went on and on. And finally, Chris Morgan did a great screenplay. He's the guy that does Fast and Furious now. Yeah. And Touchstone was going to, you know, release it. Um, but they wanted a star who could open it. And Touchstone wanted The Rock as Jack. Right. And there's there are a few people more unlike Jack than The Rock. Yeah, I mean, and no offense to fans of Dwayne Johnson, but that that him playing that character, Jack. You, you don't notice Jack. He's the guy in the crowd exactly. that you can never see, and. Yeah, Dwayne Johnson's going to stand out. out. Yeah. Oh, he's huge. Yeah. And, um, but that would have gotten the film greenlighted. But, you know, to Beacon's credit, they said no. You know, no, no, no. Um, so they had Chris rewrite it into a smaller thing with a lower budget. But, you know, then Touchstone got distracted or whatever. But, you know, so it's been, it's been all over the place. And it got to the point that people were sick of seeing a new Repairman Jack script. And I think that's really why the theatrical film thing died, because people said, not another Repairman Jack script. And um, so now they're, you know, they're they're looking for a a television venue. No. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I don't, I always thought as a fan, I'd love to see David Scal's take on a on a teleplay or a screenplay based based on Jack. Um that'd be pretty cool. I, yeah, I, I I think Scal could nail it. Yeah. Um oh sure. I mean yeah, you know I mean he and he and he and Spectre had you know similar sensibilities. Yep. And um but you know Craig would tell me that um he has to do what the studio wants. Right. You know he, he it's not just oh I just write it and we'll we'll do it. You know they have all these meetings where they say, you know, we want this, we want this. I mean, they started off with, you know, like Army thinks Jack should be a very avuncular guy and a popular in the neighborhood. And he really is a repairman. And he does this other stuff on the side. <laughs> and it was just the scenes were, were terrible. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so... You know, it, it's that's the kind of thing. More, more than, I mean, it wasn't. The, they, they weren't going to portray him as the anarchist he is anyway. Right. I mean, that was never going to happen. Um, but uh, on the bright side, Hollywood right now is that um, in February I get back the rights to the movie rights to the keep. And that's fantastic. Yeah. So we're already getting uh, offers for options and stuff and some, some from very familiar names. Yeah. Yeah. Probably nothing you can mention on the air though. I'm guessing. No, um, not until anything's signed, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't think it would queer anything, but I just don't think it's right. Um, right. They're in negotiations because, you know, we're, in, we're, we're negotiating option price. We're negotiating um, what percentage of production budget, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's all that stuff that agents do. Right. Um, so uh, I'd just rather leave. But, you know, you would you would 
the one name that's sort of got the pole position now is um, instantly recognizable to anybody familiar with the genre. Yeah. So. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I never wrote Paul a letter when I was a kid because I just I never looked in the back of the book and saw that you yeah. could do that. But if I had, I would have, you know, little me would have written him a letter and said, oh. dear sir, I've read two vampire books now. And The Keep was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the Keep and Salem's Law. I read those long before Dracula. I don't yeah. think I read Dracula till till they assigned it in school. But, I didn't read Dracula till after college. Yeah, but yeah. The, the The Keep and Salem's Law. I was all over those for a summer. So, yeah, well, you know, you, you got some great letters though. I mean, um, yeah, especially when I started doing the uh, the YA. Yeah. Because I, they, you know, now YA means an older group than it was when I started it. Exactly. Uh, but it, so we wrote for, you know, I wrote those Repairman Jack teenage books for middle graders. Right. And, you know, you, you get some, I, the one that always sticks out to me is, you know, oh, dear Mr. Wilson, um, Edgar Allan Poe is my favorite writer, but he's dead. So I'm writing to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always got to say, and I, I've never asked you this, you know, in person, privately, when we're, you know, we're hanging out at a con or whatever, but I always got the sense, and maybe I'm wrong, you tell me if I'm wrong, I got the sense you were burning out on Jack, and that those those middle grade books were a way of re-engaging and, and reigniting that character for you. Am, am I off base in thinking that? Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> um, wrong. Let no. the record show, Mary. I was wrong once this year, <laughs> and Paul oh, called me on it. Oh, once this year. <laughs> once this year. <laughs> no, um, we got a um, tour. Had this, this some higher. I guess it was Sergeant. You know, the the head of uh, Macmillan. Right. And he was saying he thought we want to he wanted to get more synergy in in the uh in the publishing you know between the the different lines and stuff like that and i said hmm um why don't i just do a ya of 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 repairman jack and that way you know you get the the tour teen involved with uh tour Para or whatever they called it. I was four. A lot of times I was being done by Forge, which was their thriller imprint. Right. Um, and, so, and that way, you know, you got the cross synergy. And um, Tom Darty liked the idea, and um, so they gave me a three book contract, and I did those those three books. But you know, but I didn't want to push any further on that. You know, I, I the the three books said what I wanted to say, showed how he developed his knack of, you know, you and him fight, that type of thing. Right. And um, so I did what I wanted to do with it, but it, I wasn't, at that point, I was not, I've never really been tired of Jack. I like dealing with him. What I don't like is worrying about, am I repeating myself? Right. And that, that is a... I mean, I, I was such a big Spencer fan, and I saw him run it into the ground. I mean, you, you get to the point where you got to say, I, you know, the character's done what he can do. I've said what I wanted to say with him. It's time for both of us to move on. Right. And I didn't want Jack going down the Spencer hole, um, where the books were so repetitious. I mean, it just... Um, I just that deja vu every time you 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 read twenty or thirty pages it says did I already read this book and I just didn't want that. Plus, I'd already written the end of the series in Night World, right. so um, I could have held off going getting into Night World and kept collecting another check. But you know, he's a he's a big part of my writing life, and I. I I just didn't want to betray him. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I ended it, you know, yeah. I, and I, I, you know, the last Christmas I, I did because the idea 
was kicked off by another book. And I said, well, okay, I had this idea for Jack all the time. I couldn't make it work. Now I can make it work. And right. so I, 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 I wrote that book, but I may never do another one. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Night World um, Signals, which I'll, I'll remind listening audience is it's it's available next week. You can pre-order it right now on Amazon. Um, how did that come about? Did you I mean, was this an idea you'd had for for the adversary cycle that you just never got a chance to write? Or was it something new that came to you? This was this came out of um, Marcon. I was yeah. a guest at Marcon, and I somehow wound up on this um, panel about writing triggers. And, you know, the woman in charge of the panel, you know, was going on about how she uses writing triggers. And she uses paintings, and she uses mm. bits of prose and stuff, or poems. And, and she said, why don't we all just Pick one of these things and you know, write write about it for you know twenty minutes. And so I've never needed a writing prompt in my life, right. but um, I thought I'd give it a try. And it was just this girl, twelve, and she's standing there next to in a field next to a a smaller child, maybe eight, and a smaller child looking up at her and holding his ears. And I was saying. Oh, what's he hearing that she's not hearing? Right. And I quick wrote off 300 words and he was hearing a sound that was, you know, making him sick and she couldn't hear it. She said, what are you talking about? And it's, it's driving him nuts. And so I, I typed it into my computer uh, after the pounds because I never throw anything away. And it started eating at me. What was he hearing? And then I was thinking, oh, there could be some signals from someplace. Um, somebody's sending a signal that only certain people can hear. And that that eventually segued into the last Christmas. Right. Um, but then people are always asking me, what happened to so and so in Night World? You know, you never, you never mention so and so again. And one, one of the ones they always ask about is this, this hack writer, um, P, P. Frank Winslow, right? And because um, he, he he's somehow tapped into Jack's life, and he his books are are, are sort of reflect what happens in Jack's life, right. and. Um, <clears throat> so I put him in the book and, and I thought it would just send her around these signals because I just found them fascinating. It was a whole new thing that I was adding to the secret history that hadn't even occurred to me before. And it's one of those things, again, where you wish you could go back 20 years and you know put in little bits about the, oh, the signals, the frequencies are changing, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? And um, another character was from the Ice Trilogy named, you know, Harry, uh, H-A-R-I. She's a, a woman, uh, a forensic accountant. Right. And people, people, people just loved her. Um, I don't know what it is about her, but, you know, she's one of these people that just really speaks their mind. And come, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, they don't have the filter and it just comes out. Right. And... Um, I love playing with characters like that. And so I brought her into it again. And, you know, it, it just, it was, I was going to write it as maybe just a little short story or a, a novelette, but it expanded and expanded and it, it got to novel length. So I said, well, okay, you know, I'll just add it in. So it, it's, there's no big master plan here. Uh, <laughs> I, it, it looks like it. It's amazing. I look at the secret history. And I say, you know, you did all that? Did you plan that? Did you know what was going on? And the answer is no. Um, <laughs> wow. I'm a great fixer-upper. <laughs> <laughs> a repairer. 
experiment. I, you know, I can take past things and and fiddle around with them and put them into a new story, and and it looks like oh, you were planning this all along. <laughs> <laughs> Is signal something? Because I'm thinking about our younger listeners. You know, if they look at your bibliography, I could see where they'd think it's daunting. Like, geez, where do I begin? Is Signals, I mean, I know it's a prequel to Night World, but is it something they can pick up and read cold without having read anything else? 90% of it, yes. I mean, there are references. Um, it's like Warden Cliff, which took place in 1903. It's definitely in the secret history. Right. Um, and has Tesla and um, it also has the secret society, the, you know, the uh, Septimus Order. Yep. Um but you can read that and not know a thing about the secret history. There's just nothing in there that, you know, is is necessary. But if you do know the secret history, you say, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the same with the signals. Um, you don't know have to know who Harry was before. You don't have to know about P. Frank Wilson from before. Right. Um, but it just turns out that his agent is a member of the Septimus Order and and – P. Frank has um, written something that's very upsetting to the order. So, it's, so a, it's, a, it's a good jumping on point then for, yeah. for younger readers that yeah. want to try your stuff yeah. out. It's um, it's amazing how many people started the adversary cycle with Night World. Yes. They picked the I've, Night World. I've, I've seen that online. I've seen people say that. <laughs> um, that's surprising me because I, I think Night World would be incomprehensible. Um <laughs> To me, but uh, I guess that, you know what. There's enough st- stuff going on with you know things coming out of the ground and, and all that, and uh, right, you can get past it. So you look back over your career. I mean, you know, best-selling author, you know, movie adaptations, television adaptations, comic books. I mean, you you you've done it all. You've written multimedia stuff. What's What's the one thing you haven't tackled yet that you'd like to? Is there is there a genre you've yet to to try your hand at? You, you know, is there is there uh, some some form of media you'd like to try your hand at yet? Or are you pretty satisfied? Um, there aren't many media left. Um, you know the. Um, you know, I've done sequential television, you know, with faster than light newsfeed uh, right. for the sci-fi channel. I've done, uh, we did, Matt Costello and I did um, Math Quest with Aladdin for Disney as an interactive teaching thing, which is really, yep. it doesn't get old. You know, math is math. And it still <laughs> teaches, it still teaches math. Right. Um, uh, you know, one, one thing I, I, I I'm too old to do it, but I always thought being a staff writer on a TV show would be a hoot. Yeah. 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 Just punching away and stuff. I mean, I, I did like the collaborative aspect of the multimedia. Um, you sit around with developers, you sit around with the um, producer. We were the writers and, and we would say what we'd want to do. And the producer would say, well, this is what we want. And then we say, well, we can do it this way. And the, the gearheads would say, no, you can't do that. <laughs> That's not possible. And then they would say something like, but what we can do is this. And we and we say, oh, you can do that? Oh, okay. Then let's blah, 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 blah. And it was such a great collaboration. You know, Matt and I were, what were we? We were about 50 years old at the time. Right. Um, Everybody else was 26, even the producers. And, uh, you know, you, <laughs> what does this sound like right now? <laughs> you're just Mary- sucking energy off them. It's just great, you know? Paul, you can't see it. Mary's laughing at me because, <laughs> you know, I do a lot of stuff for Cereal Box. Right. And I'm in the room with the producer and the director and the other writers. And I'm the 50-year-old in the room. And everybody else is 26. <laughs> yeah. But isn't it great? It is. <laughs> they're so smart and they're smart in ways that I can only imagine. Um, and, and, in that they're so comfortable with programming and the like, 
I mean, we were we, Matt and I were sitting there, and they had this. The, one of the programmers was there, and he's got his laptop, and he's typing away as we're we're saying something like, you know, that we maybe it, the interaction should work like this, and he's typing away, and then when we sort of finish up and say, yeah, well, let's try that. And he said, you know, it, it might look like this. And he turns his laptop around and hits a button. And it's it's all polygons. It's just, no, you know, there's no people, but there's all polygons moving the way we had just described. And wow. it's like, holy crap. <laughs> How does this guy's mind work that he could do that while having a conversation? You know? So okay. it was just... It was. It was. We, we got a lot of great people. Um, we got. We got. We spent a whole morning with James Cameron uh, on the Titanic game, which never happened. Right. But uh, he's a one intense guy, and he is. <laughs> he, he's amazed. So I mean, it, I uh, I just have no regrets. The '90s were probably the best writing time of my life. Um, no kidding. Just, Working for the Sci-Fi Channel, doing the interactive stuff. We traveled. You know, Disney flew us all over the place. Um, uh, Orion or Interactive flew us. We they chose a developer in England. Matt and I were were commuting to England. You know, it's just it's amazing the amount of money people were throwing around. Right. And it was just you know we, we were and I was still writing books. You know, I did my medical thrillers. I even you know. Started the uh, Jack's comeback then. It was, it yeah. was a great time. Well, all right. Well, Paul, we've kept you over an hour. I promised Paul it'd be 20 really? minutes, half an hour. <laughs> we've kept him an hour. Um, I do have a final question, though. You mentioned earlier in the interview you're working on a, a memoir or a remembrance of some type. Oh, no. Um, Borderlands is doing a 50 year retrospective. Of my short fiction in three volumes. Oh, Holy wow. shit! So it's, it's and, called the Compendium of F. All right, Tom. <laughs> Tom, I know you're listening right now, Olivia. I know you're listening. I put me down for a pre-order. I want copy number one. Unless Paul gets that, then I want copy number two. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much every all my short fiction. Um. Well, you know, this is the wonderful thing about what's going on in publishing now is that, um, like all my ephemera, I put into one volume. Uh, I called it ephemerata. Yep. And I update it every year as something because there are things that that have an exclusive on them, mm. and I have to wait till that that time period is up. But, but every every uh, winter, I put out a new digital edition. And if you you bought it before, you can just it just says new material available. You you hit the button and it, all the new stuff comes in. Yep, I, I've got it on my Kindle, and that's a, that's exactly what happens. Yep, that's a fantastic idea. So basically, everything I've ever written is in print. I mean, that's who, who can say that? Who could have said that ten years ago? Even exactly. Yeah, that's true. But is it weird to have reached a point where uh, people are gathering everything you've ever written? I mean, it's like, I, I've always wondered that. Like when Harlan Ellison had that, um, like the, the book of like all of his fiction that came out. And if 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 it's like, I don't know, I, I would imagine it's got to be sort of mind blowing to be like, first of all, to see the volume of work that you've produced over all that time. And then... I don't know, to revisit like some of the oldest, oldest stuff, which has got to be in many ways, like so different from how you write now. Oh, it is. I mean, I just rewrote my first novel, Healer. Mm -hmm. It was published in 76. Right. It's far future science fiction. And it's, you know, an alien mind joins this human being's mind. And, you know, they, they just sort of have conversations and while they're doing stuff. Um, I made a contemporary. I made the human a millennial female. The alien still identifies as male. I tell you, that changed the whole dynamic 
I mean, when you have two males talking to each other in a book, it's one thing. Now you have a female and uh, a male, and there's that gender difference. Right. That it, it just revitalized. I just had so much fun doing this. It's coming out next year. It's called Do Ad. Um, and it was like, she's a con woman. And he's basically like, you know, Sheldon from uh, <laughs> right, Big from Bang, Bang Theory. Theory. Yeah, Big Bang Theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he, he can be very annoying. <laughs> and, uh, and she's 26 and, and, you know, free to be you and me. And so it's very, it, it, it's, it's funny. It's got a lot of humor in it. But um, I think it's got a lot of heart, too. And uh, yeah. I was afraid that tour was not going to publish it but they did they took it so awesome all right well paul man we miss you uh we usually see it at least at nikon every yeah. year uh obviously that's not happening this year but it has been so good to see you and talk to you my friend yes. well, it's good seeing you guys again too yep, uh, absolutely i've been missing that's nikon fun. because of family vacations but you know yeah i do miss it you yeah. know yeah. All right. F. Paul Wilson signals on sale next week. You can go on Amazon or wherever you buy your books right now and pre-order it. We appreciate it, Paul. Take care. Hey, you too. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It was fun. Absolutely. Okay. And we're back. So there you have it. Great interview with Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary, can you vouch for the audience? What was because you you said later that you you've never seen that expression on my face when when Paul was talking about <laughs> I can't yes. remember if it's in the interview or if we had Matt cut it but uh, he, in case it didn't make it into the interview Paul talks about how every zombie novel and every yes. zombie movie he picks up is the rise uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> um it was so cute at this point um we lost a bit of video so i don't think paul saw it but his little his face <laughs> brian's face lit up it was so cute it was like yay <laughs> something nice happened this something week something <laughs> nice happened somebody <laughs> said something nice and it's not my fault and <laughs> well, you know speaking of nice things i want to give a shout out to matt wilderson i'm oh, not i'm not even going to call him Dandelion or Lion Teeth or any of the other loving nicknames that we have on the show. But uh, a, a serious shout out. Uh, you've been doing a hell of a job. Uh, I don't know how you balance this and Defenders Dialogue and Cosmic Shenanigans and your own show, Grindcast, which I do listen to. Good Beavis and Butthead reboot coverage this week, thank by you, the way. Thank you. Uh, but you're, do you're doing a hell of a job. Thank Mary, you. Mary and about 2,000 of the listeners all agreed that I should be nicer to you on the air. <laughs> So, I mean, after you called my story about rape nonsense, I was a little pissed, but you know, I eventually got over it. I was on vacation. I, I wasn't you know. referring. <laughs> I'm just curious. I you guess know, it's our nonsense. Right? I guess it's. <laughs> I guess it's because I, you know, I'm used to Dave in that chair, and I, I'm used to abusing Dave when he's into that when he's in that chair. I guess just whoever's in that I chair. I don't remember that happening to you though. Oh, no, you're. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, no. All the time. No. I never, guess that ended when I came on a year ago. Though. Never once on the show did you say I did a good job. Or, it was always about, someone heard a bird last week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that reminds me. I'd also like to say what a good job Dave has been doing <laughs> since he came back from cancer surgery and rejoined us. Um, not having him in Matt's chair has freed up his mind for more comedic content like what the, the, the jab he just threw out there at me. And yeah. This is honest to God. I'm not lying. This is what's kept me going through this process because Aww. I'm going through hell still. Um, I had a delightful day of pain yesterday. So, oh, no. um, speaking of good things though, I, I, I discovered something the other week that I want to share with the audience here. Uh, there's a lot of people in the audience that listen to metal because I hear from them all the time. There's a channel on YouTube called Two Minutes to Late Night. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know that one. Okay. I got that reference. Okay. So <laughs> if you've never seen this, it's it's hosted by a guy. His name is Guarcinio Hall. Okay. Yeah. And basically, it's if Mike Lombardo grew up as a metalhead and learned how to play an instrument instead of growing up with horror <laughs> and being a filmmaker. Because they do a, a TV show from a bar in New York City that's basically sketch comedy and, and music. And it's it's all over the place comedically. But I have to say, uh, 
Are you smarter than a merch guy? Is one of the most ingenious <laughs> things I've ever seen. Um, so right there. But the other thing they're doing, and this is why I bring this up, they're doing a thing called bedroom covers, where they're getting musicians from all sorts of different metal bands, and they do cover songs. Oh, and, yeah! Everybody records them on Skype or however they're doing it, and they, they piece it together. Oh, cool! So, they, so they've and they're doing all sorts of different things. Like did a Kate Bush song the other day. Um, you know, they've done ACDC. There's a set of Van Halen songs. It's great. There's a, uh, I don't remember the girl that sings on them. She's phenomenal. Um, oh, and the, wow. the song is really good. So anyway, just go on YouTube. It's, it's called uh, Two Minutes of Late Night. Check it out because I've been enjoying all the cover tunes. Uh, it keeps me entertained. Oh, yeah, nice. no, it's a good show. Yeah, I agree. The show's funny. I, I like I said, you know, are you smarter than a merch guy? I'm like. I'm sold. You know, I'm sold that. I'm like, this is ingenious because if you've ever been to a show, especially the metal show, the merch guy yeah. usually isn't uh, too bright. Like finding the t-shirt <laughs> sizes for it in the dark. You know? And I always like to, if you go to metal shows, why aren't they bringing smalls? Yeah. Like seriously. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Smalls, are, smalls are for people's girlfriends, really. Yeah, you're, but if you, you're buying a shirt for someone's girlfriend. It, it's But like you may need like four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it's not a knock to, against anyone that lives yeah. the metal, a, but. Yeah. If it's a rush show, yeah. <laughs> there will and be even, no women. And even Mary, you said about it's for their girlfriends. Most girlfriends that know metal guys don't want their goddamn t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's, I would totally buy you a rush shirt if they were still touring. <laughs> I would. <laughs> Be and you could wear it. it. You could wear it at night. You know. <laughs> Would that turn you on if I wore a rush shirt at night? Well, hell yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to front. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, it doesn't take much nowadays. <laughs> Is that a rush T-shirt? <laughs> oh, I'm getting. Getting. Learn, learn the lyrics yeah. to New World Man and sing it to me next time you're feeling amorous and see what happens. <laughs> I learned the lyrics to one Rush song. That's about as, as much as I can learn of Rush without my head exploding. I, I, all I can say is the older you get, the easier it is for your partner just to, to, you know, turn you on. It's like, want to? All right. You know. <laughs> so, you know no, no games need to be played. Um, Sex now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're going right. to put your phone down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not going to put your phone down. All right, whatever. <laughs> well, folks, that was it for this episode. Uh, <laughs> in, in our case, in our case, it, it, it's Mary. Did you take your arthritis and blood pressure medicine today? Yeah. Okay, good. Then we can have sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, Matt looks confused. About, look at my hand. This is my hands without arthritis medication. Imagine these crab claws coming at you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I think Mary might be turned on to the, the whole. I like to try new things. I mean, okay. Of it. Can I really embarrass you on the air? Uh, yes, please. I don't know the, about Cth- that. the Cthulhu mask. Oh, you've told that story before. Have I told that yeah, on the air so. though? I thought you did. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. Have you? The <laughs> tentacles of the Cthulhu. <laughs> have mask. you? <laughs> and keep in mind, Paul's going to be listening to this episode because you know he's the interview. He's going to want to to hear. The rapper. I just want to step in here that Grindcast does not approve or affiliate with the actions <laughs> of Brian King. <laughs> How are you feeling about being on the network, Matt? Okay, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm table that I'm not going to tell the story. <laughs> okay, I, I think enough of the story about, seems to be about implied. how you made me wear the the Cthulhu mask that one time. <laughs> I'm not going to tell the story, but I'm going to no, tell a vague that, right. version of it. I'm going to tell it, but not really tell it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say how you did awful things to yeah, me. You had to wear that Cthulhu mask, and I was Captain Nemo. And the the, <laughs> the worst part of this is I have to seg back into Dungeon Master's plea for the Animal Crossing dodo coat. I'm just not. <laughs> Sure, how to get from one to the yes, other. Yes, and if that made you feel safe for your children, <laughs> reach on out to briankeevatlive.com and send over your dodo code so your child can play oh on Animal Crossing. That's right. With uh, no Cthulhu mask. <laughs> you know, if you enjoyed this show, or if you first. Perhaps, more importantly, if you did not enjoy this particular segment, um, then you may instead enjoy Defender's Dialogue with Christopher Golden and myself, Grindcast, by our very own Matt, or maybe, maybe Mary's Cosmic Shenanigans. Where I talk about tentacles all the time. Yeah, all of those are available wherever you're listening to this show, and they're also available on Brian Keene Radio, radio streaming 24-7, uh, except for last night when the the storm knocked us off the air and I didn't figure it out till this morning. Uh all those shows, as well as exclusives, like John Urban Six Ink Stains. It's the only place you can hear Ink Stains. Mm-hmm. Of course, a ton of music. Uh, 
to access that, just go to briankeen.com, click podcast slash radio, and uh, just click the link and you can start listening right now. Um, while you're there, uh, you'll also find information uh, for advertising on our shows, uh, for booking yourself as a guest on our shows. So please check it out. Um, next week, I'm not sure one of three interviews, but I'm not sure which one we're going to actually line up. Uh, so it'll be a surprise to you, the listener. <laughs> And to us, the staff. <laughs> and right. to the interviewee. Yeah, and to the interviewee. <laughs> Why is Brian on my Skype? <laughs> it's either it's either going to be Daniel Krause. Excuse me. Bless you. That belch. No, it's going to be Dan- <laughs> Daniel Krause, Brian Hodge, uh, or Stephen Graham Jones. Uh, but all, I'm, oh, nice. all good, yeah. Options. Yeah, all good yeah. options. I'm just not sure which one. I, I need to check and see whose book is coming out next. Gotcha. And then we go from there. Okay. So. All right. Cool. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Madness Heart Press is proud to present the revised edition of Splatterpunk Award nominated author Lucas Mangum's novel about cursed screenplays, vengeful ghosts, and Hollywood death cults. A must have for fans of B movies, the revised edition contains the never before published story, Hollywood Blood and Guts, and a brand new foreword by the author. Controversial filmmaker William Ward doesn't believe in curses, but he's happy to have the hype surrounding his newest movie, an adaptation of a notorious screenplay with a dark history. As production begins and people start dying, he learns the curse is all too real, and a vengeful ghost haunting the script is only a piece of the puzzle. At its heart lies a shadowy cult manipulating events behind the scenes. As dark forces gather around him, Ward and his girlfriend Rachel must find a way to break the curse before it's too late. The revised edition of Mania is now available wherever books are sold, and signed copies are available from Madness Heart Press. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is written by Brian Keene and produced by Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Matt Wilderson, and Dave Thomas. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, Cosmic Shenanigans, Defender's Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on The Horror Show with Brian Keene, visit BrianKeene.com and click Podcasts. <laughs>